I'm now going to hand over to uh, Stephen Sacker, who needs no introduction, presenter of Hard Talk, uh, years of experience as a journalist, who will chair the session. Topic leader. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Lord Griffiths. And I cannot tell you how carefully I'm going to mind my language after <laughs> that. Um, uh, let us hope that I am not issuing apologies left, right, and centre at the end of this conversation. I'm sure I will not be, ladies and gentlemen. I'm looking forward to the next 45 or 50 minutes of conversation very much indeed. Uh, very quick set of introductions. For those of you who were here last year, and I had the great honour and privilege of being here at St. Gallen last year, uh, you'll know I'm Stephen Sacker. I work for the BBC. I have a show called Hard Talk, which as the terrible cliche goes, does pretty much what it says on the tin. It offers uh, challenging and rigorous uh, questioning uh, of people in power, people who shape our world. And it is my uh, luck, frankly, my luck that I'm able to travel the world and meet some of those who are shaping the world in which we live. Now, as it happens, a couple of weeks ago, I found myself in Washington, D.C., and as it happens, I was at the spring meetings of the IMF. And as it happens, I was granted an audience, an interview with the managing director of the IMF, uh, one uh, Madame Christine Lagarde. And it was a fascinating experience, not least a little daunting, because I was doing it in front of hundreds of policymakers, economists, economic journalists, who know a darn sight more about the detail of global finance and economics than I do. Uh, but it was a, a, a wonderful conversation. But what it really was, more than anything else, was just a warm-up act. Because the real deal happens today. Uh, I, I met Christine uh, a few uh, minutes ago. And after I'd recovered from her saying, oh, God, not him again, uh, we we got to talking about this conversation, and I know I can speak for Christine and say we're looking forward to it very much. I won't give you a big introduction on her because you all know her very, very well. I mean, suffice to say, uh, a career at the top of international law, both sides of the Atlantic, followed by uh, a, an extremely um, interesting time and, and I think a very successful tenure as France's finance minister in a government of a somewhat different persuasion from the current French government, of course. Uh, and then the top job at the International Monetary Fund, the first woman to have that job in six decades of IMF history. And if we are talking uh, about courage, and courage takes many different forms, I think Christine Lagarde in her public life has exhibited a great deal of courage. And one thing I want to say before we start talking is that thus far, as is frankly, too often the case at, at wonderful events like this. So far, most of the people on stage um, prognosticating uh, have been male. But it is worth reflecting, I think, that two of the most important players in the debate about the future of the world economy, and still more specifically the European economy today, are women. And I'm, of course, talking about Christine Lagarde and Angela Merkel as well. And I think that's a point that we should perhaps hold, it, hold in our heads um, as we continue this discussion. A final point before I shut up and let Christine do most of the talking. Uh, we have a vote. We're very keen on interactivity here at St. Gallen. Uh, we have a vote, and I can't even see if it's come up yet. Yes, it has. Um, this one is pretty darn simple. Can the Eurozone... <laughs> <laughs> I'm finished. Let me finish. <laughs> Talk about jumping the gun. Uh, can the Eurozone survive in its current form? Well, um, ah, there's a fight back already. Look, that's going to be up there for a while. And we want, as we, in the last session, we had well over 100 votes, but we want, uh, there's so many people here, we want all of you to vote, which I'm guessing will be about 300 votes. So we want everybody to vote. And I'll just say one more thing. Uh, Jean-Claude Trichet and I chewed this over with the very same question last year. And as I recall, it got um, actually over 70 percent, actually, Christine was saying yes, not no. 70 percent yes, because, of course, Trichet was, <laughs> he said it was a stupid question. It was so obvious what the answer was. <laughs> well, you know, we can think about that, too. But uh, we did get a yes last year. Uh, let's see what we get in a few moments' time. It may depend on what uh, the managing director has to say. So 
Let us begin, if we may, Madam Managing Director, and let's uh, start with a broad question, then we'll get to the Euro. The broad question is this. The world economy, I think everybody would agree, has been in a mess for a number of years. It's a complicated mess, and it's a sort of fragmented mess, but the overall picture hasn't been easy or good. Do you see the role of the IMF simply to shore up the status quo, or do you believe the IMF must be a champion of real global economic change? First of all, thank you for having me. Um, and second, thank you very much for having me back in St. Gallen. Uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure, and I, I really enjoy very much being back with the, with the team. And uh, on, on your 11th year, Joe, if I may say, I'm particularly pleased to be, to be with you. Global economy has been in a mess for quite a few years, you're right. It's been a complicated mess with complex ramifications, causes, and uh, spillover effects uh, in, 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 you know, many, many ways. I wouldn't say that it's a global mess at the moment. I would say that it's a fragmented recovery. And as we discussed last time we, we met, it's, we see it very much as a three-speed process where a group of economies, the emerging markets and the developing countries are driving the bus, if you will, cruising at about 5.3% growth this year. A second group, including the United States and Switzerland, for that matter, as well as Sweden, for instance, are in second gear and, and uh, picking up um, gradually, despite significant issues that they have to grapple with. And then the third group, uh, which is struggling to get into gear, uh, includes the Eurozone and, and to a certain degree Japan, although Japan has put together a policy mix which is going to be interesting to see. What does the IMF do in all that? Well, if I compare with business, which I was more familiar with in my uh, previous life, it is in three lines of business. One is the most traditional one. Um, it's bilateral surveillance of countries, which has evolved into multilateral surveillance of groups of countries and sometimes the entire economy to see what the consequences of domestic policies are on a more regional or global basis. That's number one. Number two, traditional as well, is the lending activity that we have. And uh, you know, to give you an, an, an idea, for instance, we have about 50, a little over 50 programs in place all over the world at the moment. Uh, in terms of number of programs, the largest region clearly for us is Africa. In terms of volume of lending, the largest area is the euro area. And what? give us a sense of proportion in terms of volume. It's about a little, a, little, a, little, a little over 60% invested in uh, the euro area, 40% rest of the world. Are you happy with that balance? Let me get to the third line of business, if I may, which is less known and really interesting. And that's what we call technical assistance and capacity building. And we have a lot going on in that area. It's the fastest growing line of business. It's one that is funded both by the IMF itself on its own resources and by the community of donors. What do we do? We help countries build their treasury function. We help countries build their public finances. We help countries build their surveillance of markets function. And there are countries that you would not think of, like, for instance, Libya, Jordan, uh, that are the largest consumers of technical assistance. And that's really a growing line of business for us. And I do want to come back yeah. to that, and I want this to be a conversation that is truly global rather than just European, but uh -huh. let's, let's stick to Europe just for a short time. And let me go back to that question yeah. I, I just tried to put to you. 60% and more of the volume of your commitment right now is in Europe. When you took the job two years ago, you, of course, knew that the, <laughs> Europe had a profound problem, but did you really expect that so much of your time and your money was going to be spent propping up mismanaged Europe? A lot of the money was already committed, because don't forget that programs like um, the Greek program, uh, Ireland, <coughs> Portugal, were already, um, it, you know, if not concluded That's in the, true, in the but making. That's of course, we've had multiple Greek bailouts. We've since had a we very had difficult yeah. Cyprus yeah, yeah. bailout. You may have others to come. Tell me if you think you have. But the point is... <laughs> the, the, sure. The, the, <laughs> the point is that Europe is just taking up 
so much yeah. of your energy and your money. And I just wondered whether you ever anticipated that would be the case. I, I didn't think that it would take as much of my time and our energy. Um, but, you know, it, what's interesting about the IMF is that we have to both be riveted on what happens on a daily basis, you know. There's no day that I don't spend, you know, beginning the day with looking at what's happening in Asia, what are the markets doing here or there, what are the CDS there, and what are the spreads over the bond here or there. But at the same time, we have to look at, at trends. And the wheel turns. You know, the IMF has been heavily engaged in Europe back 30 years ago. Then it was heavily engaged in Asia. It was heavily engaged over a recurring period of time in Latin America. It's back to Europe. So we are serving the entire community, and it takes t turn. Europe, in a way, is a sort of uh, economic, economist dream at the moment because it is front and centre of, of, a, of a huge debate about austerity and whether austerity works. Am I right in interpreting what I see at the IMF as a sense in which you're revisiting the argument as, a, as a, an institution? And there seems to be a real feeling inside the IMF that austerity only, if I can put it that way, hasn't worked, isn't working, and needs to be modified. First of all, I think it's the, it's the pride and the honor of, the, of that institution, the IMF, to constantly question, re-examine, revisit, and not work on the basis of uh, conventional wisdom or generally accepted principles. It's, you know, that's why it was also set up for, to constantly be ahead of the curve and trying to really anticipate what works, what doesn't work. So I don't see any, any you know, problem uh, with revisiting and doing so publicly, because we are accountable to the entire membership of 188 countries. And that, so that if, is, some, if something, if is, something is not working as well as we had expected, as well as the entire uh, economist community had expected, we need to go back re-examine, revisit, work through the models, uh, instill new data as they come uh, to adjust to the situation. That's point number one. Point number two, on the issue of, um, I wouldn't call it austerity, because I think that's, you know, the sort of the concept that is associated with, as um, uh, Guido Westervelle explained to us, uh, different things depending on how you translate it, depending on the language. But I would call it fiscal consolidation. What is our position? We say a few things. One is fiscal consolidation, yes, where it's needed. I'll give you an example of a place where too much of it is not needed and is actually likely to hurt, the United States, where by virtue, virtue of their normal fiscal consolidation, they consolidate reasonably, but then you put on the top the sequestration and there is too much fiscal consolidation. So first point, fiscal consolidation, yes, where it is needed. Second at the right pace. What we've consistently been saying is that there is no point doing too much of it heavily front-loaded when the entire environment is on the same pattern. So, at the right pace. And third thing we're saying, with the right policy mix, it's not just fiscal consolidation. There also has to be two things. One is the right monetary policy that accompanies the fiscal consolidation and the structural reforms that unleash the entrepreneurial potential, that unleash the investment appetite, that unleash the determination to create jobs. It's those three things together that we believe can actually work. If it's monetary policy alone, it won't be good enough because it shoulders too much of the burden. It has to be the right policy mix as well. You know, we've been saying on countries like Spain, country like Greece, don't rush, don't go too fast. Make sure that you set targets with the right timetable and reach the target rather than set for yourself really ambitious targets with the short run and the short run and a short period of time to attain them. Let, if let you me take stop the risk you if I may, because them. you're raising so many interesting points and we're not going to have time to get through them all and I'm sure the audience will want to make some of the questions uh, their own. But... What we see, and it was a phrase that came up in one of the earlier panel discussions, is fragmentation. And, and I'm now thinking about political 
uh, and economic fragmentation inside Europe. A Socialist Party document in France leaked the other day denounced Angela Merkel for selfish intransigence over uh, Germany's interpretation of what austerity means, particularly for Southern Europe. Uh, President Barroso of the Commission recently said austerity is now testing the limits of political acceptance. The unemployment rates in countries you've just referred to, like Greece and Spain, particularly for young people, are truly horrific, unbelievable. So are you now saying things have to change urgently, that policymakers have to change tack when it comes to implementation of consolidation, austerity, whatever you want to call it? Stephen, it, it's not a one-size-fits-all, okay? Um, any three-pronged set of policies, fiscal, monetary, structural reforms, has to be adjusted to the country specifics. So what will work for um, Tunisia will not necessarily work for Portugal. What has worked for um, Latvia will not necessarily work for Greece. Uh, what works for Ireland will not necessarily work for um, Jamaica that we just approved yesterday. So we need to be constantly country specific and look at what works. On the point of selfishness, you know, I was, I was Minister of Finance uh, for four years in, in France. And I've participated in all those discussions that we had about uh, rescue plans. And to, you know, assume that any of the 17 members is selfish, I think, you know, ignores the fact that on a pro rata basis and depending on their size in the Eurozone, they actually contribute to the rescue packages, they show solidarity, they give guarantees, and they are very attentive to making sure that the whole zone moves forward. Much more needs to be done, granted. But if I look back, you know, to the days when I left the Eurogroup and left the ECOFIN as Minister of Finance and joined the IMF, huge progress has been made. You know, the European stability mechanism, the new role of the European Central Bank that has removed the short-term risk away from the European scene, and the budgetary discipline that has taken new colours and new form in the zone. Those are big changes. You know, it takes 17 sovereigns, 17 languages, not languages, but 17 flags, 17 national anthems to get together on the monetary, on the fiscal side. It's enormous. A lot more needs to be done. But I think we need to step back, look at the long trend, and question whether that is going to be sustainable, which I think it is. A final thought on Europe, and then I want to broaden the conversation out, but it, it, it comes from a very interesting quotation that I picked up from a former staffer at the IMF, a gentleman by the name of Gabriel Stern, <laughs> who left the IMF a couple of years ago. He said this recently, he said, the IMF should have told Europe no lending from us unless there is energetic progress on Europe's crisis resolution institutions, in particular banking union, which I know is a big thing of yours. Mm. Is it true to say, and we remember that 60% plus figure that is the current IMF commitment to Europe, is it true that the IMF has applied different and some could say softer standards to Europe than it has applied to emerging and developing countries who for years have complained about the conditionality that the IMF has applied to them and the hawkish, tough stance the IMF has taken. You have been soft on Europe in many ways. I don't think so. And that actually, if you want to have the answer to that question, ask the Euro countries that are in those programs. They don't think that the IMF, or rather the Troika, has been soft at all. No, and if you look but I think they're more thinking about Merkel, the Germans, the internal European argument, but the, is it really, I suppose, getting down to it, any business of the IMF ultimately to spend all of this time and money propping up the world's richest economic bloc? Yes, it is the duty of the IMF, because those countries are part of the community. Uh, the role of the IMF is to make sure that there is more financial stability around the world, and whether a country is in real um, trouble and at the, at the bottom end, of the uh, GDP per capita or at the higher end, we also have to pay attention. We clearly do it in a different way in the Eurozone because it's part of the Troika exercise and we do it with, with other members 
who are financing the bulk of those programs. Uh, but in terms of conditionalities, I think we've been as, as, as consistent as was possible. If you look at, just, you know, pause for a second. If you look at the effort undertaken by Greece, for instance, uh, if, you, if you adjust cyclically and look at the structural um, reduction of deficit, 15%, uh, 1.5, 15% of GDP reduction. It's a huge effort. But, but with respect, that's, that's one nation. I mean, in the end, Europe's problems are only going to be fixed if Europe can get its collective act together. We had Larry Fink not long ago talking about Europe's banks and Europe's banking regulations mm -hmm. being a complete mess. And there is no sign yet of a true banking Europe, uh, union in Europe. There's still less sign of the sort of fiscal integration that many people believe has to be the long-term solution for Europe. So without those genuine long-term fixes, you're just putting sticking plaster after sticking plaster on a problem that is not going to go away. Fiscal aside, because I think that on, you know, if you take the combination of the six-pack directive and the two-packs directives, and I know that I speak jargon here, but they have rules in place uh, that can actually work if they enforce them and if they respect them, the big ones and the small ones, and like in 2004 and 2005. But think of the banking union. You know, it's only very easy to sit on the fence and to look at that and say, that's a mess. But I look at it as if it was a venture, a joint venture. You have 17 different partners, and they decide to put in common, not their currency, not their economy, but their banking system, which are currently supervised, identified, populated, under different rules with similar accounting principles, but certainly different from the ones uh, applied in the US, with different models, different ways of weighing risks, different ways of calibrating assets. And what they need to do is put all that together under the same supervisor, with the same resolution rules, with the same backstop. And to do that, you need to know what's underneath inside the balance sheets of those institutions. So it's hardly surprising that it's taking time. You've got a very, very sizable business that you're trying to, in a way, not operationally, but from a supervision point of view, aggregate, because they will be accountable for each other. And I'm not surprised that it's, take, it's taking time, it's taking assessment process, it's taking revision of rules, it's taking political determination to put the resolution system on the same page, but if you listen to the leaders carefully, properly, you know that there is political will behind it, but they want to know what they're heading into and how much it will cost. Well, I, I, I do listen to them and I hear an awful lot of squabbling, to be honest, but, but that's another matter. Let, let's just go to the poll, because I don't want to spend all of our time talking about Europe, because not least, there are so many people here from all over the world and it's not just about Europe. Let's just take a, a quick test of the water here because we're going to bring up another question soon. But um, you know what? Sentiment has swung r rapidly and markedly over the last year because, as you just saw there, 64%, uh, Madam Director, Managing Director, now believe that the Eurozone is fundamentally uh, doomed. No, it's not what the question said, remember? Well, it was, can it survive? Well, bring it in back. Its, yeah, bring it back. Bring it back. We want to be clear about this, otherwise I'll be issuing an apology before you know it. <laughs> Let, let's just see what the question really said. See, can the Eurozone survive in, in its, its current, current form? form? You know what? I think I would say no to that question. Ah, because, do tell. What form you know, will it take? Well, because in its current form, it doesn't have a banking union. It doesn't have yet enough of a fiscal union so that it can actually not just survive, but thrive. And the structural reforms have been undertaken at different pace in the different countries. I will say to you, that it's a momentum and it has to continue. So the form has to evolve, not, the job is not done, mission is not accomplished. And what about the numbers of members? Well, that is for them to decide, you know. <laughs> <laughs> We'd be very interested to know your personal opinion. I mean, in the end... <laughs> oh. <laughs> Don't go there. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. Uh, I know when I'm... I know when I'm sort of uh, <laughs> pushing into territory that it may not be fruitful to get too far into. Um, I will simply I, note for the record that there are apparently new members that want to join the zone. 
Yeah, that, that's true. Uh, there are also current members, frankly, many of whose people are now wondering whether they should really be in or not. And, and that, you know, that, that is the point, isn't it? You know, again, through the panels, through the course of the day, what we've heard time and again is that for people trying to run small businesses, trying to find a job, leaving school or university and trying to make an economic life, life for themselves, the system, and one can say this in Europe right now, the system is not working for them. And for some, that's tied to what they've seen of the functioning of the euro. Which is why it has to evolve. Well, it's why for Cypriots or Greeks or maybe some other nation states, it may make sense not to be in the euro. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, let's look, I want to bring, I want to bring everybody else in because you might get more out of uh, Madame Lagarde than I do on that one. Uh, I don't think so. Good luck to you is all I can say. <laughs> but, but I do want to just address a couple of other things with you which I think are very important. You mentioned Japan and, and I was delighted you did because I think it's really important to have you as Managing Director of the IMF just talk about whether you are comfortable with the degree to which some of the world's most powerful economies and governments are printing money and using other unconventional central bank means in a way that we have probably never seen before. The world is sloshing with new money, printed money. We have, we've got historically low interest rates. We've got loose monetary policy and activist central banks. As a result, we see stock markets going sky high, apparently unconnected to fundamentals in most economies. This is a recipe for long-term disaster, isn't it? You want to go back to Japan for a second because well, you said Japan it was interesting. Well, Japan is perhaps the most obvious um, instance of this. Yeah, and, and you know, back to my point about everything being country specific, and that's the the, the very interesting factor of, of the world as it evolves at the moment. You have a combination of a global economy that everybody talks about with massive interconnections, whether it's trade, whether it's finance, whether it's remittances. It's it's just highly connected. While at the same time you have country-specific situations that need to be addressed with a set of policies that are not going to be global policies, but that will be geared at restoring the stability of those economies so that they can contribute to the global game. So I think that's a point in case when you talk about Japan. Japan has been in deflation for more than a decade. And what it is trying to do with a, a, a fairly innovative um, new policy mix is to try to get out of that deflation trap and to actually move up into inflation world. So that's why the Central Bank of Japan uh, and the government of Japan, based on what they've told us so far, want to be uh, using a completely different monetary policy, targeting inflation at 2%, doubling the monetary mass of Japan, uh, buying products that they had never bought before and in significant amounts, and at the same time, you have a government that says two things, three things. One is, we need to conduct structural reforms and we will do it. We mean it, we will do it. Second, we need to provide a fiscal consolidation path that is anchored in the medium term. We need to see that, we haven't seen that yet. And third, and that's a point that I'm particularly concerned about, we want to make sure that women can access the labor market of Japan which they have been restricted from so far. So that's what's happening. It's a three-prong uh, approach and you, by Japan. You, I mean, you, we have all really got to believe in all of those promises for us not to worry that what Japan's doing is sowing the seeds for a disaster two or three or four years down the track. Because if you, you don't believe in all of the rhetoric about structural reform and everything else, it can only lead to disaster given the state of the Japanese economy. I think... You know, we, we need to give growth a chance in Japan. And wh whatever they've tried so far has not worked. So what they are experimenting now with that three-pronged approach and with the uh, diet election coming up uh, in, the, uh, in the summer, hopefully will deliver something better than what we've seen in the last 10 years. A, a final point from me, and it, in a way it, it's a big question again about the, the point of the IMF. You know, as the balance of economic power shifts, as we see China, frankly, more than any other country, become predominant in the world economy over the next 20, 30, 40 years, the current structure of the IMF, the way its head is appointed, the way its board is appointed, where the members of the board tend to come from, it all looks increasingly 
anachronistic. And as the BRICS countries and others look at forming their own financial institutions that serve their interests more than, as they would perceive it, the Western world's interests, do you fear for the future of your own organization? Organizations have to be alive and uh, alive to be kicking, which is certainly one thing that the IMF has to continue doing. To be alive, you need to be the mirror of your constituency. But you're not. The constituency of the IMF is the world. And we need to constantly... Let me just finish, because I know where you are heading. Um, <laughs> our qu the institution is a quota-based institution, right? And we review quotas on a regular basis. Every five years, the formula has to be reviewed. And we have, for the last six years, observed a shift in the quota towards the emerging and developing countries of about 6%. Too small, but it's one of the very few institutions from the Bretton Woods institutions that has evolved over time. We have currently under, I hope, completion once the biggest member ratifies the, uh, the quota reform, we will be having a board that will include less Europeans, more emerging and developing countries. We will double the quota with a shift towards the emerging market economies. And we have underway a formula review that is going to look at very complicated details, such as how do you measure GDP? Is it market GDP? Is it PPP GDP? And so on and so forth, in order to better reflect the community, which is the world, where there will have to be more room, more space, more voice, and more quotas for emerging market and developing countries than there is today. Just it's a shift that has to reflect this massive change that you refer to. And just as to. a point of information for everybody in the room, what proportion of your executive board at the moment, today, come from the emerging and developing economies? Um, if you asked um, Ali Babacha, I'm afraid he's left now, but he will tell you that between the emerging and the developing countries, they are getting close to a majority. What's the actual number? I'd just be interested to know. I mean, it's obviously less than 50%. It's, I that? think it's 46 or something like that. I, okay. I don't quote me on that because I want you know, to be able to double check uh, the, the number and I don't want to you know, mislead yeah. you in that. But it's slightly under 50% and it's clearly heading towards a complete rebalancing. Interesting and, and important. I'm talking Let, quota here, eh? yeah, which I understand. is, you know, that's money. It's what matters yeah. at the end of the day. Let, I want to bring up the second question because I think it's, it, what we've just discussed is relevant to the second question and then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, the IMF is the world's, the world's real government. So uh, partly maybe you can reflect uh, or think about what uh, Madame Lagarde has just been saying, but also just reflect on the way you see the role of the IMF in the world today and going into the future. Give us your thoughts by way of a vote on that. Well, uh, I, don't, I, I don't think you'd be unhappy with that because I don't suppose you would be advocating a notion of the IMF being the world's real government. I can't imagine many people in this room would indeed welcome that, but uh, let's, let's keep that up for a while and we'll have people think about it. Um, and I do want now to open it up because uh, I'm sure there are loads of questions, I and mean, it's a great opportunity. We've got uh, Madame Lagarde here. She's happy to take questions, and I do want questions. And I particularly want them from leaders of tomorrow rather than today. Uh, I want young people. <laughs> well, no, I, I, I do want to talk to leaders of today too, but young people are a priority. So, um, ma'am, you've got your hand up, and we're going to get a microphone to you. Uh, just bear with us. I'll take... I'll take three questions at a time. Any more than that, it gets a bit unwieldy. And you know what? I'm going to put my hard talk game face on and be a little strict with you. Be very <laughs> concise with your question because we want to get as many in as possible. You start, madam. Happy to. My name is Katerina. I'm from Austria and um, run a business in financial literacy education. My question is a question that was asked during the first panel and it remained unanswered. And I'm sure Madame Lagarde will respond to it. Um, what can we as a young generation mm. and young leaders do to improve the state of our world's system? And that includes, of course, the financial system. Yeah, good. Okay. Uh, right, we'll go... Yeah, you, madam, just there. We'll get this microphone right behind you. Just tell us your name and a very quick question. Madam, did, did, did you get the microphone? The, 
yeah, there you go. Name and quick question, please. My name is Nectaria Cerpelli. I'm a member of uh, Team Magazine of St. Gallen Symposium. Uh, Europe's austerity policies were uh, founded on faulty uh, assumptions, as uh, Olivier, Olivier Blanchard admitted in January. Is there any systemic problem in designing IMF's program? Could you just repeat the last line of the question? I didn't I quite I think catch. the question was, any, any systemic problem in designing the programs of the IMF? Exactly. Right. Thank you. Okay, good. Katarina. Right. So, <laughs> we're, we'll take uh, one from over here, because we haven't been over here yet. Uh, two of you have got your arms up, but I'm only going to choose one of you for the time being. Have we got a microphone on this side? Uh, can we get a microphone down to this side? Uh, lovely. Yeah, you, sir. Go on. He's younger. Yeah, he's younger. You're quite right. Go on. Thanks. <laughs> I'm a student from uh, Eastern Europe, uh, studying in Germany. Um, so I'm biased um, in many ways. <laughs> I can still remotely remember um, shock therapy in Eastern Europe. Uh, and I remember that there was uh, lots of debate and uh, lots of people complaining. But in the midterm, it seems to have worked. So uh, my question is, aren't we... Um, too impatient right now in Europe, and uh, shouldn't we give a chance to fiscal consolidation? Right. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's do them in reverse order, because there's a couple of questions there about basically the wisdom of, and again, we're using this loose phrase, And Europe's this is a cool. May, may I dare to send my question, even though I'm older? It's a very short one. Oh, okay. Go on, then. <laughs> well, you, Thank you. I can't stop you now, because you've started. Go on. Okay. <laughs> Right, you're, you're a polite Englishman. I, I know what it's like to interrupt people, and you okay. did me, so... I, uh, <laughs> I, you know, there's a, the Germans... The, <laughs> there's a phrase in English, if you, if you dish it out, you've got to take it. Yeah. So I'm now going to yeah. take it. Go on. The, the English are polite, the Germans interrupt. My name is Karl Heusken. I'm from a, a medium-sized uh, machine-building company out of Munich, uh, Germany. And my question uh, goes um, to Madame Lagarde, more than a former um, member of the French government, then of uh, being the director of the IMF. Um, I very much agree to your analysis of the decision-taking process and the efficiency uh, in the EU. Um, it's better than its image. Um, the question is, isn't there a significant lack of direct democratic legitimation of the decision process in the EU? And if so, is there a roadmap to change that? Okay. Right, I'm going to... No more questions just for a moment. Let's, let's hear Madame Lagarde. And, and three of those four questions, Christine, were, were all about Europe and, and whether the austerity program has systematic problems, whether perhaps we in Europe are being too impatient uh, about our, you know, our unease with the way it's working, and whether there is a fundamental democratic, democratic legitimacy problem that underpins so many of, mm. of, of these European uh, issues right now. So uh, have, a, have a go at all of that, and then we'll address okay. the other one. You know what, I'm, I'm going to address the first one that was oh. asked by the, uh, the Aust Austrian um, uh, lady. You, you asked, you know, what, what can we do as young leaders, uh, particularly to try to fix what we see as not functioning as it should, particularly the financial sector? I will tell you something. I believe that the financial sector would operate and behave better if there were more women. I know that men in the financial sector don't like it, but I believe it. <laughs> and it's nothing against gentlemen in the financial sector, but I've always believed that a more balanced equilibrium in all respects, I mean, it's an old, you know, ancient Greek philosophy principle of equilibrium, uh, that I believe has to be respected in all sectors. And the financial sector, like other sectors, uh, would, would benefit from the input, different approach to risk that women bring to the table. So if you're interested in finance, uh, if you have that um, taste, please follow that path, apply for jobs, keep up, uh, keep at it, don't give up, and uh, let's make sure that that world, too, is better balanced. Um, well, I think I, I'm you're quite right to take that question first, because the others, we have rehearsed Europe quite a lot. 
but so, let, and I want to get more questions in. So just, just focus then on the one point, because I think it is important, and we didn't discuss it in our conversation, that, that, that the European uh, decision-making process that we see play out over the sovereign debt crisis and the Eurozone crisis is fundamentally flawed because so many of the institutions involved in the decision-making, yours has to be included, but I'm thinking particularly of the Commission, are not directly democratically accountable. Two points on that. First of all, two, three points. First of all, it's a complicated system. Uh, it, it's only really when you are a European law or, or, or European institution expert that you understand the complexity and the ramification of what is of the Commission competence, what is of the Council competence, what is of mixed competence, Council and Parliament, which role the Commission plays in all that. And it's, it's, it's a complex picture. That's point number one. Point number two, it's sometimes difficult to understand the communication of that complex world because everybody has a stake in communicating to their national audience, to their particular audience, to the financial institutions, to the financial markets, and you hear sometimes discordant voices. It's, it's, it has nothing to do with the quality of the people that populate those councils, commissions, institutions. It has to do with the way roles are allocated amongst them. Your third point, which is really the heart of your question, is, is there enough of a democratic um, constituent element in, in the European institutions? And here I would observe that the role of the parliament has significantly increased under the revised European treaty, and that there is a significant push on the part of some European parliaments to play a bigger role in the decision-making process. Uh, I think it's a trend that will, uh, that will continue and that will reinforce the democratic aspect of the institution. Now back on the, very quickly, on the issue that was raised about is it working, is it not working? As I said, I tried to explain that it's, it's a three-pronged approach. It cannot be one thing in isolation from the rest. And second, when the situation evolves, when the economic stability is at stake, when the macro is evolving, clearly we need to re-examine the models. We need to re-examine whether what we are proposing is going to work or not. But I would say to I... Katarina, who asked specifically the question, who has a vested interest in that, that even with the change of the fiscal multiplier, the requirements on the Greek program in particular would probably have been the same because there was so much ground to cover. Now, ladies and gentlemen, um, I am aware that we are overrunning and we're eating into lunchtime. Can I just take a quick vote? Are you happy to... I, I don't know, Christine, you vote too. Are you happy to take a few more... I'd just love to get at least one more batch of questions in, at least three more, because we don't often get the chance to have the managing director of the IMF on a stage available for questioning. Um, Raise hands, everybody. Is everybody here prepared to put off lunch for another five minutes? Yeah, good. Good call. Um, right. Uh, so I'm going to go to the back now. You, sir, you've got your hand up. We'll get the microphone to you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is um, Jeffrey. I am um, part of the leader of Tomorrow team. Um, you have just referred, Madame Lagarde, um, to the power of... European institutions and the fact that um, they were actually doing a um, significant job. But I was wondering, um, given that many of the mechanisms that have been developed in order, in order to secure um, bailouts for uh, the countries, given that these mechanisms have been established outside EU law, that many of them are established under private law, um, whether you would see it as um, danger to um, the development of the Eurozone and your pro European project itself. Thank you. Okay, uh, I did, yeah, you had the microphone, you go ahead. Uh, hello ma'am, I'm Atul Mishra from India. 
My question is, uh, institutions like IMF are right now working a lot in overcoming uh, Euro crisis. Uh, my question is, is anything do being done to make sure that the crisis does not happen in future? I mean, the urgent work is to overcoming. But the important thing is, are we doing anything so it does not happen in future? Mm. Right. OK, thank you very much. Um, yes, sir, you just here. Uh, we'll get a microphone to you. If we just bear with us. It's on its way. Just stand up. Give us your name and very quick question. Um, thank you very much. My name is Yuya Ueda from Japan. I work for Bank of Japan, Japanese Central Bank, as you mentioned before. And <laughs> is, this your se is this your second <laughs> question? I, I believe Japanese recovery contributes to the world. And then last year, uh, Ms. Lagarde went com coming to Japan. You said, you, you said about that uh, we Japanese use more labor of women. And I want, to know, I want to know more concretely because it's really important things for Asian country. So thank you. OK, all right. Um, right, uh, Christine, I'm afraid we are going to have to be really brief. Um, okay. Uh, the f I don't know if anyone is one that you want to take first, but we've got a question about Japan and, and the, the nature of the, the reforms that you've been calling for, um, how to ensure the Eurozone crisis isn't repeated, and one about whether you, you worry about... Um, Public versus private law. Yeah, exactly. Okay, I'll, I'll take them in reverse order. The, um, again, country-specific. Issue about Japan, aging population, Significant pension scheme expectations and health benefits. You've got a few solutions. One is immigration. Second is make sure that you use the potential that you have available offhand. You have untapped talent with Japanese women, generally very well educated, who can access the labor market, who have all the skills needed, and who can make a difference. We commissioned a special study in our research department to measure what the outcome would be. It is significant. And it's significant for Japan, it's significant for other countries as well, which is why, you know, all gender apart, I very strongly support that move, and I was so pleased to see that Prime Minister Abe is actually going in that direction and making sure that there is infrastructure available to help Japanese women to access the labor market. I think it's one of the responses needed for that market under the circumstances of that aging population of, of, of it. No recurrence of the crisis in the future. The IMF tries not to be just a fireman, but we're also trying to propose renewed architecture uh, and, and, and better structure for the, for the future. Are we going to prevent crisis going forward? Probably not, because capitalism is a system that moves in a way from crisis to crisis, and uh, everything we do uh, is to sort of temper, alleviate, uh, remedy when possible, but to assume that we're going to prevent them, I think would be uh, wishful uh, thinking. But yes, we do try to offer advice. We do try to recommend solution in order to avoid that this be the case. I'll give you one example, uh, because it's been raised many times over. In the case of Cyprus, where we went, you know, and, and, and had the difficulty of putting in place the adequate program to deal with the, the issues. If there had been what we are recommending, which is a solid European banking union with a European supervisor, with a European backstop, with a resolution system, with the authority in the system to actually decide and implement what was needed, that would not have taken place. Because the European supervisor had the duty, will have the duty, we hope, to actually supervise directly the three largest banking institutions in each, in each and every uh, member state of the Eurozone. Those two Cypriot banks, which were literally insolvent, would have been spotted beforehand and would have been decided uh, beforehand. That's one example. On the issue of you know, European law versus private law, I'm not sure what you're talking about, because any of the, of the programs that have been decided uh, by countries and the Euro partners have been embedded in the right decision-making process of the European institutions and were approved uh, by the appropriate body of the ECOFIN on proposal by uh, the Commission, which had worked together with the ECB and the IMF. As far as the IMF side was concerned, they've all been subject to the, uh, uh, the, the board of the IMF, which is in and of itself an in international law institution with international uh, law applying to it. So I, 
Mm. I, I think I've covered your ground, but I'm not, no, I'm not I, sure I think, I think you have. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I'm in a quandary. I mean, I, I wish we could carry on because I suspect there are many more questions on the floor. Unfortunately, I, I also think that um, organization will start to unravel unless I bring this session to a close, simply because we've all got to have lunch. There are important uh, and fascinating sessions coming up this afternoon. And, you know, if we don't get something in our stomachs, we won't be on firing on all cylinders. So I think at this point, let's just refer back to this. Uh, I think Madame Lagarde wants to know whether she is running the world's government. No. Um, and the answer is no. Good. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> Yeah. I dare say, I dare say if there were ever to be a world government, you might win a few votes to be the first president, but, but that's not going to happen and you're not standing. But in the meantime, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you all for the questions, for your engagement with what has been a fascinating conversation. And most of all, I want to thank Christine Lagarde for being here with us. So thank, thank you. you very much indeed. Christine, thank you. Thanks, Kate.